When I first put together this study, I realized I had far, far too many quotes. Far, far too many. I knew I had to take some out. What I wanted to do in the first place was to show that our church was a non-Trinitarian, sometimes very anti-Trinitarian denomination. But, having realised I had too many quotes, what I did, I thought, well, I'll take, because it's become a more or less accepted fact now that we were a non-Trinitarian denomination, I thought, I'll leave out the quotes themselves, all right? And put in a few summaries that, that you know very well, but <coughs> probably some people who are going to watch the video haven't seen, all right? But it, it just shows, really, that our modern-day scholar will accept the fact now that we were a non-Trinitarian denomination. Perhaps one of the most famous one now, um, George Knight. Most of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventists would not be able to join the church today if they had to subscribe to the denomination as fundamental beliefs. Now, I believe that that is very much an understatement. Because simply because our church, as a denomination, right through to the time of Ellen White, for decades beyond, was a non-Trinitarian denomination. So it's not just a case of most of the families. The entire church was non-Trinitarian. And the other churches, the Trinitarian churches, they knew it. And that was something that they had against us. More specifically, most would not be able to agree to belief number two, which deals with the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, Jerry Moon in the book of Trinity, then most of the leading Seventh-day Adventist pioneers were non-Trinitarian, their theology has become accepted Adventist history. More recently, a further question has arisen with increasing urgency. Was the pioneers believe about the Godhead right or wrong? As one line of reasoning goes, either the pioneers were wrong and the present church is right, or the pioneers were right and the present Seventh-day Adventist church has apostatized from biblical truth. And he has said that very plainly. And really, that is the question. That is the question that everybody must ask today. Will we right up there and wrong now, or will we wrong up there and right now? And it's a question that everyone really has to decide upon somewhere along the line. Uh, Merlin Burke, one of the remarkable aspects of the history of the Seventh day Adventist Church is the development of the position of the Trinity and the deity of Christ. And I think that's a bit misleading. Because as we shall see in a minute, all of our pioneers believed in a complete and full and whatever else adjective you would like to, to use, <laughs> divinity of Christ. These doctrines did not become normative in the church until the middle of the 20th century, meaning in the 1950s. And it wasn't until the 1950s, if you look at our history, um, even into the 1940s, there was this dispute that was going on. It was still going on. And I, I mean, I wasn't around in the 50s. I didn't come along until the 70s. Uh, but the Trinity uh, word then, the word, was, was just commonplace. You know what I mean? And I think it became more commonplace by the, the mid-1950s. Uh, that's, that's the way that I see it. Right. Now, this is something very important that I'm going to try and put across here. Uh, what I want you to see is the pattern. Right? You will see a pattern emerging through all these quotes that I will give you. Uh, this is Russell Holt. He summed it all up. A survey of other Adventist writers up to this time, he's talking about up to 1881, the death of uh, James White. A survey of other Adventist writers during these years reveals that to a man, uh, that's not leaving anything out, is it? That's it. To a man, they rejected the Trinity. Yet, with equal unanimity, to a man, they upheld the divinity of Christ. And yet, what is said today? You don't believe the Trinity doctrine? You don't believe in the divinity of Christ. See the pattern emerging in a minute. He went on to say, to reject the Trinity is not necessarily to strip the Saviour of his divinity. Indeed, 
certain Adventist writers felt that it was the Trinitarians who filled the role of degrading Christ's divine nature. And that's the stand that I would take today. I believe that Trinitarians are robbing Christ of something today. Uh, J.H. Wagner. This is going back to 1884. Um, this work was called The Atonement in the Light of Nature and Revelation, and it started off with a small work, and over the years it built up and up, and I think it had various publications over about 23 years, 25 years, can't quite remember now. But this was obviously well accepted, this work was well accepted in Seventh-day Adventism. Many theologians really think that the atonement, in respect to its dignity and efficacy, rests upon the doctrine of a trinity. But we, Seventh-day Adventists, but we fail to see any connection between the two. To the contrary, the advocates of that doctrine, the trinity doctrine, really fall into the difficulty which they seem anxious to avoid. Their difficulty consists in this. They take a denial of the trinity to be equivalent to a denial of the divinity of Christ were that the case, we should cling to the doctrine of the Trinity as tenaciously as any can, but it is not the case. They who have read our remarks, they again, our second <coughs> remarks on the death of the Son of God, know that we firmly believe in the divinity of Christ, but we cannot accept the ideal of a Trinity as it is held by Trinitarians. Now, notice the word in here, as it is held by Trinitarians. We can use the word Trinity in a proper sense, mm -hmm. in a proper sense. Although it's not a biblical word, we could still use it in a proper sense, but not as explained by mm -hmm. Trinitarians. Without giving up our claim on the dignity of the sacrifice made for our redemption, I think we ought to meditate upon those words along there because the Trinity Doctrine takes everything away from what Christ did at Calvary. Mm -hmm. The dignity is gone. You know, if, 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 as I said just now, if, you, if, if you're a Trinitarian, then all you believe that died at Calvary is human nature. Mm -hmm. now, what's that taking away from Christ? You're, you're saying to him, well, you didn't really die. You were all right. You were still alive. It was just, sorry to put it like this, a lump of human flesh that died at Calvary. That's all that's being said. Um, J.H. Wagner, Divinity. <coughs> this is the, an earlier uh, rendition of the same, the same work. The divinity and pre existence of our Saviour are most clearly proved by those scriptures which refer to him as the Word. And he quoted John 1, 1 3, and said, This expresses plainly a pre-existent divinity. Then after quoting John 1, 18 and 3, 16, saying that Christ was the only begotten Son, according to this, Jesus Christ is begotten of God in a sense that no other being is, else he could not be his only begotten Son. And that was Cameron. He continued, God made men and angels out of materials already created. He is the author of their existence, their creator, hence their father. But Jesus Christ was begotten of the father's own substance. He was not created out of material as the angels and other creatures were. He is truly and emphatically the son of God, the same as I, and the son of my father. Um, this was in the Review and Herald. Um, this, there's only a little quote here. I didn't, I didn't put in all of it, but... What was happening, it was a, a train journey. And two of our uh, members, Seventh-day Adventists, they were coming back from a conference, laid in a man. And they got in a conversation with two congregationalists. And one of these congregationalists began talking about the Sabbath. You know, and they thought it was the wrong day, etc., etc. Obviously, they thought Sunday was the right day. And apparently, this lady, Seventh-day Adventist, um, really put them in their place over the whole thing. Now what happened then, this other congregation, congregation has said, do you believe in the divinity of Christ? And that is where uh, this Brother Johnson steps in. He says, 
I now thought it was my turn to join in. So I replied, why, yes, sir. We believe that Christ is all divine, that in him brought the fullness of the Godhead bodily, that is the brightness of the Father's glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. Interesting conversation. 1868, uh, obviously a letter into the Review and Herald. The answer comes back to A.S. You are correct in saying we do not deny the divinity of Christ. If those who assert such a thing are acquainted with our faith, they know better. If they do not know, they are guilty of speaking evil, evil of the things they know not. In other words, if anybody knew anything about our faith, they know that we believe in the divinity of Christ. And what you'll see is in a minute, a couple of other people said it, uh, at least two of them. Um, I know Ellen White said it, same thing. You'll come to that, and that's a very, very important statement by her. 1871, uh, this is James White talking to a missionary. Uh, this was on the train journey as well. This missionary seemed very liberal in his feelings towards all Christians, but after catechizing us upon the Trinity and finding that we were not sound upon the subject of his triune God, he became earnest in denouncing Unitarianism, which takes from Christ his divinity and leaves him but a man. And what we see here is a pattern again. You don't believe in the Trinity? You don't believe that Christ is divine. Same pattern. Here, as far as our viewers, viewers were concerned, he was combating a man of straw. We do not deny the divinity of Christ. We delight in giving full credit to those strong expressions of Scripture which, which exalt the Son of God. We believe him to be the divine person addressed by Jehovah in the words, Let us make man. He then goes on to say, Give the Master all that divinity which the holy scriptures clothe him. And then he said, Our adorable Redeemer thought it not robbery to be equal with God and that all the people say, Amen. 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 James White. Did he ever deny the divinity of Christ? No way. Absolutely no way at all. James White again. Principal difference between the two bodies, we're talking about Sunday and to Sunday Baptist. The principal difference between the two bodies is the immortality question. Seventh day Adventists hold the divinity of Christ so nearly with the Trinitarians that we apprehend no trial here. In fact, in one sense, he would say, well, if it wasn't for the immortality question, we could come together and be one. Mm -hmm. That's what he was saying, really. Um, James, well, again, Paul affirms the Son of God that he was in the form of God, that he was equal with God. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not what we to be equal? The reason why it's not robbery for a son to be equal with the father is the fact that he is equal. Mm -hmm. If the son is not equal with the father, then it's robbery for him to rank himself with the father. Plain, simple, logical reason. Uh, 1878, Reader Review asks the seven Adventists were Unitarians or Trinitarians. Neither can the answer. We do not believe in the three-in-one God of Trinitarians, nor in the low views of Jesus Christ held by the Unitarians. We believe that Christ is a divine being, not merely in his mission, but in his person also. Mm. Under the heading of Christ not created being, the question was asked. Strange question, but it's not strange really when it probably was coming from a Trinitarian point of view. Will you please favour me with those scriptures which plainly say that Christ is a created being? <laughs> that was the question that came in from one of the, the readers of the review. The answer came back, you are mistaken in supposing that seven Adventists teach that Christ was ever created. They believe, on the contrary, that he was begotten of the Father and that he can properly be called God and worshipped as such. In 18, now this is interesting. <laughs> You've probably read this, you've probably read all my stuff. You, you, you know, I'm not even repeating really what's in there. Uh, but the Methodist Church issued a book, published a book, 1888, 1889. It was about the Sabbath. And they obviously opposed the Sabbath. And what happened, they gave it to some of the actors to review. Uh, E.J. Wagner took up the task of, of reviewing it. All right? 
at the time, he was uh, co-editor with A.T. Jones, Sons of Times. The interesting thing is her book was all against the Sabbath. But for the next six weeks, Wagner, Wagner didn't talk about the Sabbath in the Sons of the Times. He spoke about the divinity of Christ. Why? Because in the preface to the book, what this author did bricks. He put, along with other teachings, he said we had wrong. I can't remember what they are, but I expect it was investigative judgment and all sorts of things like that. I can't remember now. But what he said in the preface of the book was, we do not believe, seven Adventists do not believe in the divinity of Christ. And that is where Wagner said, okay, now I'll print six consecutive articles, six consecutive weeks on the divinity of Christ. And these are just one or two of the things he said. Look at this again. But when the Doctor of Briggs states that Seventh-day Adventists deny the divinity of Christ, we know that he writes recklessly. We are fully persuaded in our own mind that Briggs knows better. But, be that as it may, the statement has been made so often by men who profess to know where all they were speaking. In other words, who profess to know what you're talking about, that they have come, many have come to believe it. And it's true. You know, you repeat something enough times and people will come to believe it. And for their sakes, as well as for the benefit of those who may not have given the subject any thought, we purpose to set forth the truth. We have no theory to bolster up. I wonder if you meant Trinity Doctrine. We have no theory to bolster up. And so instead of staying proposition, we should simply quote the Word of God and accept what it says. We believe in the divinity of Christ because the Bible says that Christ is God. Mm. That is so simple. Don't need any other explanations. It is simple as that. Refer to John 1 verse 1. Indeed, we have never heard of anyone who doubted that the evangelist has reference to Christ in his passage. From it, we learn that Christ is God. Now we come to E.J. Wagner's Christ and his writings. And I'll, I'll try and breeze through these. Right? It's all talking, I know, but I'm, I'm trying to form a picture in your mind and, and people who will be watching this video that they read things in books, in articles, and whatever have you, and they say that because seven Adventists were not Trinitarian during these years, they denied the divinity of Christ. And it's, it's an unfair accusation. It's a misleading accusation. It's a confusing uh, accusation. The word was in the beginning. The mind of men cannot grasp the ages of man in his graves. It's not given to men to know when or how the sun was begun, but we know that he was the divine word. Not simply before he came to this earth to die, but even before the world was created. There was a time when Christ proceeded forth and came from God and from the bosom of the Father. For well, that time was so far back in the day of eternity that to finite comprehension, it is practically without beginning. The point is that Christ is a begotten, begotten son and not a created subject. Mm -hmm. This name God was not given to Christ in consequence of some great achievement, but it is mm -hmm. his by right of inheritance. He came forth from the Father, as the creed said, not from God, true God from true God. He continued, a son always rightfully takes the name of the Father, and Christ is in begotten Son. God has rightfully the same name. A son also, to a, group, uh, to a greater or lesser degree, a reproduction of the Father, for he has to some extent the features and personal characteristics of his Father. Not perfectly, because there is no perfect reduction uh, production amongst mankind. But there is no imperfection in God, or in any of his works. And so, Christ is the express image of the Father's person. As a son of the self-existent God, he has by nature all the attributes of deity. Now that book, uh, uh, Christ and His Righteousness, is said to have depicted, he wrote that in 1890, well it's published in 1890. Right? Now it's said to depict his message in Minneapolis. There was no problem with, with what Wagner said concerning Christ's deity at Minneapolis. No problem at all. 
The only problem was between how a person is saved, law and grace. What was spoken of here about the Godhead, it brought no problems among seven Adventists. What Wagner had in his book was standard seven Adventist teaching. Christ is in the bosom of the Father, being by nature the very substance of God and having life in himself. Now look what Wagner says now. He is properly, properly called Jehovah, the self-existent God. Now the referred to Christ as the self-existent Son of God. She was totally in agreement with Wagner, what Wagner said here. Uh, with Wagner and Jones, they went all over America, going to the bigger churches, bigger camp meetings, for three years until the church decided to split them up. Sent Ellen White over here, which I'm sure we're very glad of, and they sent Wagner to England, you know, and near the twain should meet after that. And you know very well that um, I can't remember the exact date now, but Ellen White ran back and uh, wrote back to the conference and said, God, I have nothing to do with sending me over here. She said, That was your work. She said, God wanted me. In America, at the center of the world, but by God allowing her, allowing the church to do that, it gives us an insight into how God works. He allows things to go on. He doesn't just necessarily say, "I didn't want that to happen. Woof, I'll stop it." He doesn't do that. He sometimes lets things go on to see how things develop, to show rather how things develop. Now then, this is the important one. Alan White experiences the misunderstanding of others to the non trinitarian faith of Seventh-day Adventists, and that was out here in Australia. She says, in this country, the denomination of ministers tell the most unblushing falsehoods. That's a nice way of saying something that could be put uh, a little bit more straight, isn't it? the most unblushing falsehoods to their congregations in reference to our work and our people. That's interesting. 12th of May, my birthday. In May, I should expect a card. <laughs> unblushing lies to the congregations. Whatever false report has been started, it is circulated by those who oppose the truth and is repeated from church to church, from community to community. The circulators of these forces take no pains to find out whether or not they are true, for many of those who repeat the reports, though not the framers of them, still love the false reports and take delight in giving them wide circulation. Human nature. Mm -hmm. They do not, like honest just men, come to those who are accused and seek to find out what is the truth concerning what they have heard in regard to their faith. But without inquiry, they spread false statements in order to prejudice the people against those who hold the truth. Now that should really be saying something to us today. She is saying that what some of the Adventists were doing were preaching the truth. But look at her next statement. For instance, an effort was made to obtain the use of a hall at a village four miles from Hastings. Now, is Hastings somewhere down... Into... Pardon? I would mention it's New Zealand. New Zealand, yeah. It's, it's where? In, in New Zealand? Yeah, I know it's in, it's in New Zealand, is yeah, it? Yeah. Right. Uh, there is a Hastings near here in the Hastings River, but I don't think this is what she's yeah, referring to. Yeah, I didn't know where it was. But it said, where some of our workers proposed to present the gospel to the people. But they did not succeed in obtaining the hall because a school teacher there opposed the truth and declared to the people that Seventh-day Adventists did not believe in the divinity of Christ. Same pattern. What does she say? This man may not have known what her faith is on this point, but he was not left in ignorance. He was informed there is not a people on earth who hold more firmly the truth of Christ's pre-existence than the Seventh-day Adventists. Now, isn't that Plain. She's I mean, what's the problem? You see, we have our church. We were saying that Christ was divine. We were saying that uh, Christ is literally the begotten Son of God. And here, a 
1893, Ellen White says that there is no people on earth who hold more firmly to the truth of Christ's pre-existence than seven day Adventists. She's tying that in with the words deity of Christ, divinity yep. of Christ. That's right. That's which again right. is one of the problems we have with the misunderstanding today. Yeah. But the answer was given. They did not want the doctrines of seven day Adventists should be promulgated in the community, so the door was closed. Mm -hmm. 1895, Alan White. This is what she says. She sent back to America with this message. The Lord His great mercy sent the most precious message to His people throughout the Bible and James. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to His divine person, His merits and His changeless love for the human family. Now, you've seen these statements before, and I, I, I want to uh, just compare them, uh, because it's telling us something very important. This is from uh, Wagner's Christ and Righteousness, 1890, and like 1895, Signs and Times. Wagner, it is true that there are many sons of God, but Christ is the only begotten Son of God, and therefore Son of God in the sense in which no other being ever was or ever can be. The angels are the Son of God, as was Adam, by creation. Christians are the Son of God, by adoption. But Christ is the Son of God, by birth. Now, as far as I can remember, that's the only time why in this book said birth. I might be wrong. But nearly every other time he says begotten. But this time he says birth. 1895, Ellen White says this. A complete offering has been made for God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten Son, not a Son by creation as in the angels, nor a son by adoption, as in, as in the particular sinner, but a son begotten in the express image of his father's person, and in all brightness of majesty and glory, etc., etc. Right? Look at a comparison. Look at a comparison. Wagner, the angels are sons of God, as was added by creation. Christians are sons of God by adoption. Christ is the son of God by birth. How of life. Not a son by creation as for the angels, nor a son by adoption as a sinner, but a son begotten in the express image. What's the difference between the two statements? Nothing. And birth. Absolutely nothing. And I'll take a lot of convincing, I'll take a lot of convincing that Ellen White didn't copy Wagner's statement. <laughs> she copied that statement. Yeah, well, reworded it anyway. Yeah, right. Reworded yeah. it. Yeah. But her statement was based on what Wagner said. She had no problem at all with what I would say. I just thought, uh, so a lot of this, I didn't mean, ever see that before, but um, on Trinitarians, we usually say um, Christ took on the role of a son. Couldn't you s say that when she says, not a son by adoption, would taking on the role of a son be similar to a son by adoption, you think? No, uh, she's talking here. Well, I know what she's saying. No, no, no. I'm, I'm talking about from the Trinitarian standpoint. When they <coughs> say that Christ took on the role of a son, wouldn't this be by by showing that and pointing out that he couldn't be a son by adoption? Uh, They're taking on the role of a son. Isn't yeah. that the same as a son by adoption? Yes. I think. I think oh, yes. I never pointed yes. out. Yes. What is being said here, all right, is if I can use the, the, the phrase, the origins of Christ. Right. That's what we're talking about right here. Yeah, we all know that. Yeah. 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 But I can't, I can't see how anybody can twist him. She, she's honest. denying that he is a son by adoption, but the tri Trinitarian uh, position of that he assumes the role is equivalent to a son oh, by sorry, adoption. Oh, sorry, I see what yeah. you're saying. I, never yeah, saw sorry, that I didn't understand what you're saying. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I got it now. Yes, you are right. We use that, right? I wonder yeah. if we can point that out to a Trinitarian yeah. law. You're saying that he took on the role. She says yeah. here, he's not a son by adoption. Yeah. I, oh, I, I just have never saw that. It didn't click until You see, some, some will say he didn't become the son of God until uh, Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. Which, that's the easiest one. To and miss. you could Ooh. say that, you know, son of God by birth. You say, well, well that's birth of Bethlehem. But here, she she phrases this as it's a divine birth. Yeah, but she just, yeah. she, she didn't use Wagner's by no. birth. No, she, she, she used, used specifically God. 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 See, that's, for to her, that was the, it's the equivalent. Mm. Right. It's the same thing. Yes, sir. She understood what Wagner was saying, expressed it 
that way. More explicitly. Pardon? She expressed what Wagner was saying. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. This is what Wagner was saying all through his book. And then in that one place, he says birth. As I said, he might have said it somewhere else, but I don't think so. Uh, six weeks later, just six weeks later, the eternal father, the unchangeable one, gave his only begotten son, tore from his bosom, him who was made in the express image of his person. Before, she says, begotten mm -hmm. in the express image. Here she uses the word made. I sent him down to earth to reveal how greatly he loved mankind. Now you and I know that Ellen White did not mean created. There's no <coughs> way because she does say so many times he is God himself mm -hmm. in the person of the Son. So we see Ellen White was in total agreement with our not just the pioneers, more than the pioneers. She was in total agreement with what the church was teaching. But today, that's lost. That truth is lost. People people don't understand that today. They, they When you talk to them, um, they think of Ellen White as in some sort of opposition to people who were teaching that Christ has begun. But she taught it herself. Yeah, but in three years, she will have different understanding. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think there's a, I think there's a, a note of cynicism in your voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I take your point. Um, but you're obviously talking about desire of ages. But you see, desire of ages, to, to a degree, was a compilation of her old writing. She didn't just sit down and say, well, I'm going to start writing the desire of ages. But this went on for donkey's years, this putting together this book on the life of Christ. It wasn't called the, the, the Desire of Ages when it first started. It was a book on the life of Christ. And it got divided up uh, eventually because there was too much in the book. There was uh, Christ Object Lessons and what was everything? Thoughts from Mount Blessings. Thoughts from Mount Blessings. Yeah, Thoughts from Mount Blessings. It got divided up because there was too much material. Like, like too much material <laughs> doing it here. Um, yeah, it wasn't a book she just sat down and wrote. Her, her secretaries actually found bits and pieces from her writings and stuck them in scrapbooks and, and, and made it up as they went along. And they, they'd come and say to her, we, we can't find enough on the resurrection no, or, yeah. or whatever I do. And she would write something on it or find something out of her writings herself. And that's how the desire was formulated. Um, it's 1895. This was only three years before Desire of Ages was published. That book was in, in the proceeds of compilation many, many years before. In fact, I think it was happening before she left for Australia. I'm pretty sure it was before uh, being put together before then. So, early 1900s, and a white return from Australia. She comes back to find twin attacks are being made on Seven Day Alpha's Doctrine, the sanctuary by Alvin Ballinger. Calling Christ by Kellogg and other certain things that I believe were being taught in our colleges then. I believe that. Uh, because uh, if I get the chance in the next presentation, we talk about the 1919 Bible conference, I think it's said there that uh, Christ not begotten was being taught in our colleges there. And there's a whole mixture of beliefs that were uh, going on. So I think you can see from her writings in the early 1900s that there were attacks on the personalities of God in Christ in our, in our publications even. We're all going to jump now to the 1905 General Conference session. Because to me, it's important in, in our history, in particularly where Ellen White was concerned. Because it was at this conference that Ballinger was judged, and his work was judged. But also, notice what, what she was saying to the delegates. Let not any man enter upon the work of tearing down the foundations of the truth that have made us what we are. God has led his people forward step by step, though there are pitfalls of air on every side, under the wonderful guidance of a plain, thus saith the Lord, a truth has been established that has stood the test of trial. And when men arise and attempt to roll way disciples after them, Meet them with the truths that betray as by fire. You remember, 
And I don't like stinking here, if you would have asked her. She would have said the begotten faith the Seventh-day Adventist regarding Christ was correct. And that is the truth. And she would have had that in her mind at this time. Those who seek to remove the old landmarks are not holy and fast. They are not remembering how they have received and heard. And I think I have to remember this conference, 1905, there were a lot of people there who were not there back in 1844. And if you see some of the things that she wrote, she, she is telling people how, how God took, you know, this little group of believers and how God took her and, and gave her uh, visions, etc., when they couldn't understand certain passages of Scripture. Obviously, because people weren't there then. Some of them were new. You know, they were going to a conference, maybe. Perhaps they'd been only seven down just for a few years. And they didn't really understand. I don't know why it was explaining. Those who tried to bring in theories that would remove the, remove the pillars of our faith concerning the sanctuary or concerning the personality mm -hmm. of God or Christ are working as blind men. They are seeking to bring in uncertainties and to set the people of God adrift without mind. Mm -hmm. How, how much more clearly can anything be said? When men come in who have moved one pin or pillar, that's it, one pin or pillar. She couldn't say it any more clearly. From the foundation which God has established by his Holy Spirit, let the aged men who are pioneers in our work speak plainly. And let those who are dead speak also by the reprinting of their articles in our periodicals. Does that happen today? Mm -hmm. No way, I was saying. No, no, no. no. Yep. They're kept hidden. Oh, yeah, they're there in the archives for everybody to see. Aren't but they telling us what they meant, though? <laughs> Aren't they telling us what they meant? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Revising yeah. history. Gather up the rays of divine light that God has given us and has led his people on step by step in the way of truth. This truth will stand the test of time and trial. Same again for the delegates. There are those who are always seeking for something new. If they understood it right, they would realize that the newness they need is that which comes from a daily growth in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us keep firm and unshaken and our faith in the message that God has given us for these last days. Just as when she went on to say, and what was in Ellen White's mind when she said this? She knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. She knew full well what was going on. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. All through the scriptures, the Father and Son are spoken of as two distinct personages. Why do you think she said that? <laughs> because of the next word. The yeah, name exactly. Name. Because she knew what was going on. She knew exactly what was going on. You will hear men endeavouring to make the Son of God a non-entity. He and the Father are one, but there are two personages. What did Arius get condemned for? He said they were two separate personages. Long sentiments regarding this are coming in. We shall all have to meet them. The words of a prophet. Was she right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. God wants us to cherish the truth and the simplicity in which we have received it from Christ. And I think that's the answer, you know. Mm. You know, when you go to a study of the gospel of God's word, if you go there with an unbiased mind, you go there with a blank page, and you will not help to see that there is a God who has a loving son. And all this this Trinity oneness, it's all this allegorizing that, that has gone on, that eventually destroys the personality of both of them. In 1905 she wrote the manuscript, the Lord would have us at this time uh, bring a testimony written by those who are now dead to speak on behalf of heavenly things. The Holy Spirit has given instruction for us in these last days. We are to repeat the testimonies that God has given his people. The testimonies that present clear conceptions of the truths of the sanctuary and they show the relation of Christ to the truths of the sanctuary so clearly brought to view. And all I said in 1905, we don't need anything new. We have it. Um, continue. If, if we were the Lord's appointed messengers, 
We should not spring up with new ideas and theories that contradict the message that God has given us through this movement since 1844. Mm -hmm. At that time, many sought the Lord with heart, soul, and voice. The men whom God raised up were diligent searchers of the scripture. Ellen White had an extremely high regard for these men. I know she wrote them testimonies. I know she wrote them testimonies and said, look, you're a little bit wrong in your life there, and so on and so on. But when it came down to their theology, she had no argument with them. No argument whatsoever. I know she led them on to a certain degree uh, regarding the Holy Spirit. She led them to believe the Holy Spirit is a personality. But if you read the, the writers, uh, most of them, they represented the Holy Spirit as the representative of God and Christ. It was only Ellen White to come along and added that personality bit and said, he is a personality. She did not say he is a personal being exactly like the Father and the Son. She never said that. She never said that at all. And those who today claim to have light and contradict the teachings of God's ordained messengers who are working under the Holy Spirit's guidance, those who get up new theories which remove the pillars of our faith, they're not doing the will of God, but they are bringing in fallacies of their own invention, which, if received, will cut the church away from the anchorage of truth and set them drifting, drifting to where they will receive any sophistries that may arise. These will be similar to which Dr. H. Kellogg, under Satan's special guidance, has been working for years. It's frightening, isn't it? You know, you read something like that. You know, and it brings that text to mind. You wrestle not against flesh and blood, mm -hmm. principalities mm -hmm. and powers of darkness fight. Well, you know, we're not wrestling against men when, when we start talking about this Godhead issue here. We're wrestling against Satan, and the only hope we have is to um, be firmly in Christ. God sends no man. Look at these words. God sends no man with a message that leads souls to depart from the faith that has been our stronghold for so many years. Mm. We are to substantiate this faith rather than tear down the foundation on which it rests. Well, that, those are strong words. They really are strong words. And it was when the Seventh-day Adventist Church was still a non-Trinitarian denomination. We hadn't brought in this co-eternity bit. We hadn't brought in this this belief that the Holy Spirit was a person like God in Christ, and we hadn't brought in this one substance bit. This is where we were then. And what has happened, we have departed from, as a denomination, we have departed from the faith. Then Alan White warned that, I hadn't got that in She said, many would depart, depart from the faith, taking notice of seducing spirits. Well, there we are. I think what I tried to do there was to show that we did believe in the divinity of Christ even though we were not Trinitarians. I also wanted to show that Ellen White endorsed that view. She had no complaints about it. No, no, no complaints whatsoever. And I think if we can if we can show this to people, I think it, 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 it can have an impression on their minds it's just telling, all it is really, is telling people the truth. It's as simple as that. And let the truth make the impact. We don't have to make the emphasis. Let the truth do the work. 